Welcome to Gas, the true story of a toxic train derailment. I'm Ron Scholl. Last time on Gas, plaintiffs built the case that Montana Rail Inc. has run an unsafe railroad for many years, culminating in increased accidents and failed rail, leading up to the Alberton spill. MRL dismissed the accusations as a junk railroad conspiracy theory. We also considered the recent history of Curve 155 inspections. We now continue with Part 6, Chapters 14 and 15. Chapter 14, Alberton Fallout Eight track failure derailments in the first four months of 1996, compared to 28 total in the previous five years, prompted the FRA to conduct a special investigation of MRL that spring. The FRA inspected rail conditions on MRL's main track in five subdivisions and conducted spot checks on curves for wear. The findings were yet another indication of extraordinary conditions on the MRL track. After the FRA measured rail wear on 336 curves, MRL abruptly scheduled 18 more curves for 1996 relay. Fifteen of these curves were already worn beyond MRL standards, including four supplemental curves MRL had added for relay since January. MRL relayed 128 curves in 1996, an 83% increase from their original plan of 70, set in 1995. The FRA wrote, "The MRL in some cases had not measured curves for wear at points throughout the entire curve." bringing to mind Keller and Cantu's single field verification of Curve 155 in August 1995. The FRA measured on curves that appeared excessively worn, they wrote. MRL either missed much worn track or consciously decided to delay relaying worn track that was very close to or met their standards for relay. The last point had already been proven with Curve 155 in 1995. While MRL attorneys would argue that meeting the standard per se did not trigger relay, the FRA's spotlight on these worn curves did trigger relay. Train speed on some of these additional curves had already been reduced, and following the FRA investigation was now reduced on all 18 until relay. This action contradicted Roger Babcock's testimony that slow orders were not issued solely for wear below MRL standards, which plaintiffs claimed should have occurred on Curve 155. Slow orders, of course, slowed freight, giving incentive to relay a curve faster. But conversely, heavy traffic gave incentive to put off relays and not issue slow orders. The FRA noted that MRL's gross annual tonnage had unexpectedly increased 20% over the past year to about 41.3 megatons, which MRL well knew. This increase in tonnage caused accelerated curve wear to the extent that numerous curves reached the MRL limits for relaying sooner than had been projected, the FRA wrote. The FRA found that in 1995, Sperry Rail Service detected 553 defective rails with 205 service failures. Sperry found another 532 defects just between January 1 and April 11, 1996 including over 40 vertical split heads. The previous eight-year average had been about 528 defects, so through April 11, the yearly defect rate had more than tripled. In 1996, MRL's rail defect and rail service failure rate was about twice the national average. On the fourth subdivision, including Curve 155, detected defects had more than quadrupled since the MRL takeover from Burlington Northern. By 1996, MRL track reached a critical threshold. The FRA added, With higher axle loads and overall increased annual gross tonnage, MRL wear limits may have to be adjusted to allow less wear before the rail is relayed. The FRA concluded, MRL is headed in the right direction to get their, quote, worn rail problem under control. What did MRL do about their worn rail problem? After the bare mouth derailment, Keller stepped up inspections, adding more curves for relay with the FRA's help, among other steps. Though MRL attorneys would deny it, by implication, the FRA held that there was something MRL could have done earlier to prevent some of their derailments. MRL claimed the Alberton derailment had nothing to do with worn rail or the timing of relay, 
much as it would claim a plaintiff's illness had nothing to do with chlorine exposure. This stance would be greatly aided by the fact that the FRA did not regulate worn rail per se, and so the FRA had no power to issue citations based on rail wear. Just to be safe, though, MRL attorneys moved to exclude the 1996 FRA rail assessment document as evidence. In the Schlieb case, Judge Don Malloy found it sufficiently relative to an accident incident report to exclude it from trial. A jury would not hear it. But yet other troublesome documents would surface. While MRL lawyers argued the company did all that it could and should have, MRL made changes after Alberton, and Keller became more cautious due to the rash of derailments. Then came the June 3, 1996 Knoxon derailment, also due to a VSH. We've never faced a rash of derailments like the last few months, MRL President Bill Brodsky admitted publicly. We're going to get answers, he said. A spate of memos to roadmasters from Keller followed, emphasizing better inspections and concern over vertical split heads. Keller also wrote a critical letter to Sperry Rail about the analog tapes concerning the Alberton and the June Noxon vertical split head derailments. Finally, in another June 11th letter to the NTSB, Keller reported the initiation of an aggressive safety audit. We have also instituted a policy that requires dispatchers to put a 10 mile per hour slow order when a problem is reported by train crews until someone can be called to look at the problem, he wrote with known defects such as a VSH. MRL already had a slow order policy in their standards. Though MRL claimed in court they had done all they could and should have in maintaining and inspecting track prior to the Alberton derailment, they clearly made an effort to do much more afterwards, and this included re-emphasizing policies already in effect, but apparently gone lax. Keller seemed genuinely concerned about rail wear, vertical split heads, and derailments. But plaintiffs saw these actions and earlier documents as evidence that MRL could have and should have done more earlier. This flurry of correspondence was obtained with other FRA documents only after Judge Malloy ordered MRL to produce them. MRL Railware first hit the news in 1998 after Malloy's sanctions in the Schlieb case. Until then, MRL effectively kept quiet their worn rail problem. Chapter 15. Split Heads The general theory held that the vertical split head on curve 155 formed at or near the location of a minuscule slag inclusion, a seemingly innocuous impurity entombed during milling that lay dormant in its mother rail for 28 years, until that fateful day when the tiny flaw derailed a behemoth and unleashed 100-ton tankers of toxic chemicals upon a community. The multi-million dollar question, why April 11, 1996? The vast majority of VSHs are detected and removed before a derailment occurs, but MRL had three VSH derailments in six months by June 1996. Detected VSHs on MRL had almost doubled from two years earlier, further proof of a deteriorating line. The Sperry Rail Manual defined a vertical split head as a progressive longitudinal fracture in the head, where separation along a seam spreads vertically through the head or at or near the middle of the head. The origin point was typically defined as an internal longitudinal seam segregation or inclusion. Thus, both the origin point defect and the incipient VSH were hidden. The separation progressed lengthwise and upwards for some distance before gradually turning out to either the field or gauge side of the head. Typically, in cross-section, a VSH formed a Y-shaped crack as it neared the running surface. The surface metal was harder and the fracture couldn't go straight up. Once the seam or separation opened up anywhere along the length of the VSH, the growth became rapid. Usually, the first surface break showed in the web, as with curve 155. If undetected, eventually, one side of the vertically split head broke off under the stress of passing trains. Of biggest concern was a VSH on the gauge side of rail. If the gauge side of the head broke off while a train passed, the car wheels tended to climb to the top of the rail or drop into the gap left by the missing headspace. Derailment. In the Alberton rail failure, the field side of the rail head initially broke off, 
but due to rail wear, there was little gauge side left to receive stress. As the VSH ran its course, the remaining rail shattered under the weight of the train. A Sperry test might internally detect a young VSH. If not, a VSH was considered dangerous because it usually wasn't visible on the surface until it had grown several feet long. Not every VSH arose from defects, such as inclusions. The track encyclopedia noted, Some VSHs will result from rail fatigue and eccentric loading alone with no apparent internal source. Fatigue referred to lifelong tonnage. Eccentric loads referred to wheels out of alignment or with out of round areas or flat wheels, also called dynamic or impact wheel loads. These shock loads increase force two to three times. Rail fatigue, wear, and dynamic load stresses could also be additional factors in a VSH associated with an internal defect, the very case Alberton plaintiffs sought to make. Critical to litigation was how fast the Curve 155 VSH grew and whether MRL should have been aware of it. The Sperry tape anomaly was highly suggestive and plaintiffs felt it proved the VSH was at least internally started by March 1, 1996. Inspectors should have caught it before derailment. MRL had missed significant defects before, including a 10-foot VSH on Earl Perrine's territory. MRL's railway operations expert Donald Hofeld claimed that VSHs develop rapidly internally in the rail and are widely known to be difficult to detect by visual inspection. Plaintiff experts countered that VSHs developed over an extended period of time, though growth was incrementally rapid. A rapid growth followed by a rested growth process. An FRA study likewise found that the typical VSH grows lengthwise in rapid erratic jumps until all of the continuous areas of stringers or poor microstructure have been encompassed. It appears further growth in the vertical direction is required before the risk of failure becomes significant by means of a slow fatigue mechanism, they said. Thus, a VSH could lay dormant for some time, even after having reached its full internal length. The wide range of VSH lengths was not surprising. They often depended on the length of the stringers in poor quality rail. If a defect was the seed of the Alberton VSH, its ultimate length reflected the string of inclusions, the poor steel microstructure that continued in either direction. A VSH defect was regulated by the FRA. Once detected, a small VSH called for action, but not immediate removal, followed by a 90-day inspection. A VSH of 2 to 4 inches allowed for a maximum speed of 30 miles per hour, then a 30-day inspection. A VSH of 4 inches called for slower speeds. Over 4 inches called for 10 miles per hour, observation, and replacement within 5 days. Implicit in these standards was expected slow growth and that small VSHs could be detectable. Based on the Sperry tape, Plaintiff expert Ronald Dunn believed the VSH was at least a foot long on March 1, 1996, and then grew over the next 40 days. The Alberton VSH was at least 12 feet long when the rail failed. The east terminus went undiscovered. Dunn felt the final length of the VSH was a minimum of 20 feet. MRL expert Jude Iguamizi believed the Curve 155 rail failed in one sudden load. He opined a so-called non-bonded area made this rail failure unique. There would have to be something unique about the failure if growth happened this fast because the FRA VSH remediation guidelines went on the assumption of slow progression. MRL's mechanical engineer expert James Freeling opined the vast majority of the VSH occurred in one fast structure mode after a, quote, non-extremely rapid fracture in the one to two inch slag inclusion area, from a baby to a giant overnight. Freeling opined a foot-long part of the web broke out with one train, then a catastrophic rapid VSH occurred, most likely due to a dynamic load on the next train. Metaphorically, Emerald argued this VSH was akin to an explosion. Chief Engineer Keller originally agreed that the dip the train engineers felt indicated a portion of the VSH had already broken out. The broken out VSH was at least a few feet long to allow the wheel on the locomotive to move over a little bit, he said. 
A VSH was an FRA-regulated defect, but plaintiffs had to prove that MRL was negligent in their inspections. In their effort to prove that railwear contributed to the VSH, plaintiffs faced a major battle. Next time on GAS, the true story of a toxic train derailment, we take a close look at Montana Rail Link's railwear standards and how railwear might have contributed to the Alberton derailment and toxic chemical spill. Until then, this is Ron Scholl. Thanks for listening. This podcast is adapted from the book Gas, the true story of a toxic train derailment. Visit Amazon.com to see the two-book series. To access support material in the book, such as maps, photos, illustrations, and video links, visit my Facebook page Gas, the true story, or watch my Gas playlist on my YouTube channel at R.L. Scholl.